welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. Will you stand with me? Let's get into the word this morning. For those of you that are uncomfortable with a woman preaching, I just want to give you great comfort in that God spoke through a jackass to Balaam. So surely he can speak through the mom of the house this morning. So just take a breath. It's going to be okay. I may get a little loud and shrill. I'll try not to do that because I know that's hard on your ears. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this season. Thank you that at the end of our year, we can step back and just say, wow, what have you done? Mighty God, who are we that you would love us so much that you would do this for us? So today as we open your word, Lord, open our hearts. As we look into the word of God, Lord, let the word look into us. Your word says that it's able to change us, that your word makes wise the simple. Surely we are simple people, Father, so cause wisdom to come to us this morning. Revelator of the church, Holy Spirit, precious Spirit of God, how we are grateful that you teach us. Teach us now. Bless all the churches in the Inland Empire that name the name of Jesus. They are one with us in family. And I ask that you bless my husband, Lord, wherever he is. Thank you for our families. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to the book of Luke. And we're going to be looking in the second chapter, reading a passage of Scripture and launching off from there. And I want to set the stage tonight, or this morning actually. And I guess I should welcome those, if you're streaming online this morning, welcome to the 10 o'clock service at The Rock. I know there are people that do watch from around the world, and so we're glad that you're with us. What an amazing technology and what an amazing generation we live in. So welcome. Welcome to our service. So in the book of Luke, in the second chapter, let me set the stage. Jesus has been born. He's 40 days old. He's still a newborn, but just a tiny little guy. And in the book of Leviticus in the 12th chapter, God makes very clear what is to happen in the case of a childbirth. I mean, the law of God was given to Israel, and it was given to actually cover every aspect of living, from finances to relationships, to what to do when you have a child, to how to organize your life, how to have relationships. Everything we need for living is in this book. And God said that when the firstborn comes forth in the womb, that you are to bring a lamb, and you are to bring a sacrifice to that place where God is worshiped in Israel, it's the temple. They're in Jerusalem. They're in Bethlehem, three miles from Jerusalem. And if you're poor and you can't afford a lamb, then bring two turtle doves. But you are to bring, after 40 days in your purification, you are to go to the temple and you are to sacrifice. And there you are to bring a thanksgiving and a sacrifice to God for the firstborn if it's a boy child. And so Mary and Joseph, being under the law and being devout, have two turtle doves, and they have Jesus all wrapped up. Bethlehem's about three miles from Jerusalem, and they're making the walk there, and they're about to go into the temple. And there we find our subject today, Simeon, who happens to be an old man, and he is also on his way to the temple. So if you'll go with me to Luke chapter 2, we're going to begin reading in verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the customs of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, and there I'm going to just take a moment and pause, and I want to say something to you. Simeon is a just and a devout man, and he's an old man, and he has a God encounter. The name of today's message is Expecting the Unexpected. Expecting the Unexpected. Because I believe in this Christmas season, 2012, as we open it up, I believe that God is saying to us at The Rock, this can be the greatest Christmas you've ever had, or this can be your worst Christmas. And it's not dependent on our circumstances. It's not dependent on our finances. The state of our union, the state of our homes, our relationships, the state of our bodies, whether you have a good report or a bad report from the doctor, whether your children are serving God or they're not serving God, 
Whether there is money in your bank or there is no money, whether you don't know how you're going to see the next paycheck or where you're going to pay the next bill, that has not one thing to do with how wonderful our Christmas can be. And I believe God is challenging the rock this year, 2012, to learn from a man who was just and devout, who lived 2,000 years ago, a complete stranger to us, to learn from a man whose words were pinned by the Holy Spirit for you and I today because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Every word of God is God-breathed. It is profitable for the man and the woman of God to give us instruction, correction, reproof, repute rebuke and correction in other words it says that we would be grown up and that we would come to the full stature of Jesus Christ God wants us to grow up he wants us to be like Jesus and this is the book that can show us how to do it because it's not just words on a page it is the living breathing word of God and when I hear it faith comes in my heart and when I do it my life is changed and Simeon has four things today to teach me on how to have the most amazing Christmas in 2012 I've ever had. So we've just read that he goes to the temple, that he sees the child, verse 28. He takes him up in his arms, he blesses God, and he says, now here comes the word of the Lord, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel and for a sign which we spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And in these words and in this prophecy of a complete stranger, a just and a devout old man who'd been promised by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until he saw the consolation of Israel. That word consolation of Israel, that phrase means the comfort and the hope that God had promised Israel. From Genesis 3.15 when God said to the serpent, there is one coming out of the seed of the woman. I'm putting war between you. Out of her seed, you will bruise his heal but he is going to crush your head and when Adam had the dominion over to Satan through sin and Satan usurped the dominion of this planet and became the God of this world and the world fell into darkness there was a promise from God all the way through that there would be one coming that would crush the very kingdom of darkness and would open up the way of salvation and redemption back to the people of God and bringing them back to the Lord they were waiting. Simeon was waiting. So in Simeon's words, four things this morning I want to say to you. Four words from Simeon. How can I have a great Christmas? And what are his words got anything to do with me having a great Christmas? Number one, Simeon saw God in the small and the insignificant things. This Christmas, this season, God is challenging us as a people to see him in the small and the insignificant. Simeon held a baby, but he saw the king. He took Jesus up in his arms in verse 28. He took a baby, a newborn infant, a stranger. His parents had a turtle dove. They didn't even have a lamb. They were broke. They were poor. They were nobodies. They were strangers. They were people he had never met. But by the Spirit, he came into the house of God, and the Spirit of God led him to his divine encounter. And when he took up that baby, that little nothing of an infant, nothing. I mean, I just saw Emma. She's six pounds, six ounces. Who could look at a brand-new baby? and see the salvation of the world. But Simeon looked at this child and he said, Behold, now my eyes have seen the defender, the king, the one that's been prophesied, the consolation of Israel, the one we've been waiting for. My eyes have seen the king and the kingdom. Now I can depart in peace. And church today, how much more shall the church of the living God lift up our eyes in the small, the mundane, and the insignificant? And see the mighty God in the very small. When instead of seeing the mighty and the intimidating. And seeing ourselves and our God small before that. Let me ask you a question. 
Do I see with the eyes of faith or do I see with the eyes of unbelief? Because God has wired me to see with the eyes of faith. And the eyes of faith will see what is not obvious in the natural world. And yet we live in a world that is filled with giants. We live in a world that is filled with voices and choices. We live in a world that comes at us constantly and tells us what isn't going to happen. How this could be. The scenarios of failure. The scenarios and the, and the frames and the pictures of fear that Satan constantly paints at us. Even our movies are filled with darkness. And yet God says, will you step away from the darkness and will you be a people like Simeon, just and devout, led by the Spirit of God? And will you be able to see in the small, the mundane, the ordinary, what happens every day? Will you be able to see my salvation? My deliverance, my prosperity, my kingdom, my invisible, my ability to do the impossible. Will you be able to see it this Christmas? Church, it's up to us. Just and devout, you already are. Just means you've been justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Just, just as if you never sinned. It's a Christian word. It's a biblical word. But it means so washed in the blood that you are innocent before the Father. Devout. What does devout mean? It means I am dedicated. That in my heart of hearts, there is no one but the king that I want to hear from and see and live for. And if you're not there yet, then this Christmas, this can be the Christmas you fall in love with the king. This can be the Christmas where you chase the divine romance. This can be the Christmas where you absolutely hear from God and you see the God of the invisible. Listen, if you could have a moment with God, if you could step from the line of time into the line of eternity, that invisible line where he lives. We live in a linear corporeal world. He lives in the invisible realm of eternity. And we could have a conversation with him face to face. And we could see his brilliance, his power, his glory, his majesty, his sovereignty. I guarantee there wouldn't be one moment when you came back that you would be afraid or fearful of anything. Because you've met him. And when you've met him and you've met the king, and you know the king loves you, then there's nothing more in your life. It's settled. Now it's just simply being led by the spirit, seeing the invisible so you can do the impossible. And salvation, deliverance, prosperity, God's kingdom, God's invisible, absolute power and ability to do what we cannot do is all around us. He is not uptight. He is not worried about our lives. He is not worried about our taxes. He's not worried about who's in, in the White House. He is not worried about the condition of our city. He is not worried about the condition of our paychecks. He's not worried whether or not we've got a roof over our heads, food in our bellies, shoes on our feet. You know why? Because he said the Gentiles seek these. You seek the kingdom of God, child. And all my righteousness, my way of doing things, and all these things will be added unto you. You see, Simeon held a child. But he saw the king, and he saw the kingdom. I believe the challenge of the Holy Spirit to the rock is be led by the Spirit into the house of God this season. Don't just come to church to be in church. Don't think, it's brownie point, God, are you, here's my attendance. How about if we're led by the Spirit? Every time we walk on this campus, every time we sit down, every time we hear the worship, every time we open the book, every time we have the opportunity to gather in the corporate anointing of faith, every time we say, Lord, speak. Lord, speak to us. Lord, show us our lives. Lord, talk individually to every one of us. Lord, show us what's to come. Lord, show us what you want for our lives corporately and individually because the Holy Spirit wants to lead us by the Spirit to see God and the small and the insignificant. It's all around us. So number one, I believe Simeon says to us, see God in the small. And don't see yourself small in the face of the great and the intimidating. Number two, look for a better future. Look ahead to a better future. There's something about humanity. We're made in the image of God and he's wired us for hope. If there isn't any hope, you're going to get a sick spirit. Proverbs says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when it comes, it's a tree of life. That tree of life is life that nourishes and flourishes your soul and your spirit. 
When humanity does not have hope, humanity despairs, becomes depressed, and becomes suicidal and self-destructive. And Satan knows in the kingdom of darkness that if he can steal our hope, if he can steal the joy of the Lord, if he can steal that from us, that we will be a people that will exist, but will have no joy, will have no faith because hope points. The picture of faith. And we will be a people that just exist and get by. And yes, we'll be saved, but we'll accomplish nothing in the kingdom of heaven. And I don't know about you, but I want 2012 Christmas to be supernatural. I want, I want the fingerprints of God all over it. I want to see my family healed. I want to see things restored. I want to see your lives better than they've ever been. I want to see you hearing the voice of the Spirit. I want to see the love of God so shed abroad in your heart that you are head over heels in love with Jesus, unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing that it's the power of God unto salvation, like the early church. Don't just patty cake like this. Come on and give him a clap offering because he's worthy. Wake up, church. Let's be the church. Let's get up and let's get going in this place. The kingdom of God is coming to us and the king is here. And Simeon looked for a, a better future, a bigger future. He said, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people. He understood this future included everyone. It wasn't just about him, us four, no more, just my family. No, all people. He was a Jew and yet he saw the ethnos. That's what the word peoples is there. All nations, the Gentile nations. Because in the word of God, there's only two classes of people. There are Gentiles, which is all nations, and there are Jews. So it doesn't matter what color your skin is. You're either a Jew or a Gentile. That's it in God's eyes in this book. And Simeon looked for a better future. Simeon saw the hope of the coming kingdom of God. Now here's, here's the vision that God challenges us with this Christmas. First, he says, I need you to see me in the small things. I need you to have faith to see salvation all around you. Because obviously, everything else is glaring at you and screaming at you. But you can switch perspectives. See God in the small. And see the great things that are looming against you as small in the sight of God. Number one. Number two, look for a better future. Well, what does that mean? It means understand something. Church, if Simeon 2,000 years ago can take up a baby and see a king in a kingdom, how much more should the 21st century church now look to a better future and the return of the king? How much more should our eyes be on Jesus focused on heaven and living to see the return of the king of glory. Now, that's a very foreign thought to the 21st century American church. I grew up in a generation, born in 1950, in the Jesus movement, about the second coming of Christ. We had a great scenario. We had this great theory on, on tribulation and revelation, and the Lord is coming, the Lord is coming, the Lord is coming, the Lord is coming, and he didn't come. But Peter writes about that in 2 Peter, the third chapter, he says, In the last days, scoffers will come saying, saying, Where is his return and where are the signs of his coming? Everything is as it was. He warns us about that. Now, I don't know whether or not the theories on Revelation are right or wrong because I don't believe anybody's got the scoop on that until the generation that's going to live it, quite frankly. I think there's a, a lot of holes in all the theories of God's coming. I know he's coming. Because he says he's coming. That I know. I know we're not appointed to the wrath of God because I got the word of God on that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let everything be established. I got more than one verse on that. We're not appointed to the wrath of God. So I know the church, wherever we are, earthbound or whether we're in heaven, we're not appointed to the wrath of God. So you don't have to be afraid. I know that. I know there's a rapture. I know there's a catching away. I know there's a generation that's not going to see death because the word teaches me that. Everything else... I don't know, and I don't care about that. So we teach ready rapture. Get ready. The Lord is coming. Have your eyes up. Have your shoulders back. Live according to the ways of God. Be the light that shines in this darkness, and live your life because the king is coming. Look forward to a better future. Period. I got to live my life as if today 
He's coming back for me. And listen, life is short. This could be my last day on the planet. So for me, these are my last days. And for you, these are your last days because you're not coming back. And God says, your time here is vapor time compared to eternity. So I guess Simeon's saying to us this Christmas, get a reality check of what's real and what isn't. This earth is temporary. You're in an earth suit. You are a spirit being made in the image of God, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, born of the spirit of God, a new creation in Christ Jesus. You are here on this planet to bring the kingdom of God to the ethos, to the generations that are here. But it is vapor time. Don't get too bogged down in it. Look up. Know your redemption is drawing nigh, And look forward to a better future because the king is coming. Period. We don't have to be afraid of death. We don't have to be afraid of dying. He's already tasted death for us. We're just going to slip from one dimension to the next. That's all this is. So number one, see God in the small things. There's salvation all around us. Number two, look to a better future. My mama tells me, and she's still alive, my little Swedish mom. She says, Debbie, the only thing you're going to hit when you look in the rear view mirror is what is in front of you. When you look back and you don't look forward with hope and you look back with regret or you look back with sorrow, I guess it's all over. You know, as you age, you can do that because your life can get smaller because you can't. I don't ski anymore. My husband used to ski. His knees got bad, so we don't ski anymore. Things you don't do that you used to do when you were young. And it would be easy to let your life just kind of dry up and get small. But you see, though the outward man perish, the inward man is being renewed day by day. And God never said dry up and die. He said stand up, be a living memorial, and take more ground in your old age like Caleb. There's more to do. There's always something to look forward to. I don't care how young or how old you are. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. God says get some hope in your heart. Look toward a better future today and tomorrow because the king is coming and salvation's all around you. So Christmas this year. Look for a better one. Number three, understand that change is going to bring conflict. There is going to be conflict and confrontation in your life with your families. If you just get that and just understand that is normal Christianity, you haven't done anything wrong. As a matter of fact, you've done something right. You're going to have a lot more comfort and peace this Christmas with your relatives and with your relationships. Now, what do I mean? Jesus is in the arms of Simeon. He's talking to Mary and to Joseph, and he says in verse 34, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, for a sign which will be spoken against. Now that sign that he's speaking about is the cross. They're in a Roman occupation. God gives us promise and hope in the worst case scenarios. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now, wait a minute. That's not so good. You're holding my baby, and you're saying, my eyes have seen your salvation. He is the king. I know he's the king. I had angels worshiping. I had shepherds coming. There's wise men everywhere. I know this. And yes, I'm so glad that another confirming witness, and then Anna comes along. I mean, there's confirming witnesses everywhere, but now all of a sudden, it's sort of switching and changing. And Simeon is saying, a sword's going to pierce your soul, Mary. This child is for the rise and fall of many. And the hearts of the peoples of the earth will be opened before that cross. There's going to be a sword. And you know that cross? like the hilt of the sword, plunged into this planet, and it pierced Mary's heart. What is God saying? With change, with the kingdom, with righteousness, with light, is going to come kingdom conflict and confrontation. You will not be the popular one that you think you should be. When you do right, you will get persecuted as if you did wrong. The family that loved you when you were drunk with them and went off with them and partied with them and was okay with them. And they could come and tell you their secrets. They could tell you who they just slept with, who they just fell with, who they did this with. All of a sudden, they're coming to you now and you're saying, oh, you cannot do that. They're going to step back and they're going to go, oh, what, what happened to you? You're going to that church too much. 
You're giving money to a cult. You're giving them all your money. You're doing all of this. You see, it's the same scenario generation after generation after generation because you are the light of God on this planet as the church of the living God. He's the head, you're the body. And the darkness will fight against the light. Now, here's what Jesus said about this. Luke 12, 49. I come to send fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on the earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. Yes, he is the prince of peace, but he understood he was warning us that there will be division between mother and daughter, between father and son, between family and family, between daughter-in-law and mother-in-law. You can read that out. Yes, he's the prince of peace, and yes, the kingdom of God brings its shalom and its peace and its prosperity, but 1 Peter chapter 3 says, all who will live godly on this earth will suffer persecution. My question is, are you being persecuted? Because if you're not, what are you doing wrong? How about that one? If we're shining, guess what? There's going to be some confrontation, and there's going to be people that aren't going to like us. And he warns us about that. So if you're going to have a great Christmas, instead of being disappointed in your people, just expect it. And God says, listen, here's how you handle that. Love them to life. Don't judge them to death. They're going to fight against you. It's going to take time. Rome wasn't built in a day. That's an old proverb. And the world isn't saved in one day. It takes a lifetime. They're going to watch you this Christmas. They're going to see how you handle conflict. They're going to see if you're preachy. They're going to see if you condemn them. And God says, don't you know that it's the goodness of God that brings us to repentance? It's not judgment. So how about this one? At your tables, when you're with the family, when you're at work and you're with a hostile environment, instead of getting in the fray with them, how about loving them to life? How about not judging them to death? How about letting them bring their wine? Maybe you've stopped drinking. You know what? There for so long, Jim and I, we were such stick in the muds that we wouldn't even let wine come into our house. We got the reputation as the religious fanatics. Now, we've grown up. We realize, okay, I'm not drinking, but if you want to bring wine, you're paying for it, but come on. And if you're drunk, I'll be your designated driver. I'll get you home safely. Now, am I telling you to get drunk? Don't you dare. <laughs> the Word of God says don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. But how about being that piece of the family puzzle that brings light and goodness and not judgment and harshness. Don't get into religious battles or political battles at your tables. Love your people to life. Talk about them. Ask them questions. Don't preach at them. But when they ask you about what is it about you that's different, then ask the Holy Spirit for the grace to speak with the graciousness of heaven seasoned with salt to tell them of your testimony of what God's done in your life. But understand, there will be conflict in this kingdom. Number four, last one. So let's just go over them really quick. Number one, this Christmas, 2012, if I'm going to have the best Christmas, I'm going to have to see God's salvation in the small and the insignificant. It's in front of me. I just have to ask God, open my eyes, lead me by the Spirit. It's right there. Number two, look forward to a better future. When I want to look around and be in despair or look back and be sorry or be sorrowful, Look ahead and know that the king is coming, and there's a greater future for all of us, and this is temporary. Let's do the best we can while we're here. But don't put your roots down in this place. You are on assignment as ambassadors of the kingdom of God passing through this world. Number three, understand there's going to be conflict and confrontation in this kingdom. And when you do good, there will be evil coming back at you. Don't be surprised at that because number four, here's the last one. Remember who is with you. Emmanuel, God with us. Because in the midst of all of this world and craziness, in the midst of all of this, it's Christmas. And Isaiah the prophet said, that behold, a virgin shall conceive, and she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, being God with us. 
The angel told Joseph, Emmanuel, quoting from Isaiah, who wrote that word and that prophecy 750 years before Jesus was ever born. He wrote it. He pinned it. Then the angels came to Joseph and said, this is what he is, and this is who he is. Emmanuel, God with us. It says in the book of Romans that if God is for us, who can be against us? Who is Emmanuel? Who is this amazing baby? Who is this king that Simeon took up in his arms but saw the kingdom and the king? He is the living and the breathing life giver. He's the star breather. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the firstborn from the dead. He is the high priest of our confession. He is our intercessor. He is Abraham's rod. He is the son that was led up to Mount Moriah, the lion. He is the lamb. He is all that we'll ever need, all that we ever have. He is everything to us. He's Emmanuel, God with us, and he is for us and not against us. Now, if God be for us, church, Romans 8, 31, and I'll leave you with this. What then shall we say to these things? Conflict? Yes. Adventure in adversity? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're not going to need faith in heaven because we're going to see. Right now, you need faith on the earth and in every adversity in every giant that comes against your promise, in every delay that screams at you and says, God says no because God's delays are not his denials. He's coming, but it takes time. It takes time. He has seasons. Looking forward, understanding conflict, God says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall we not also with him freely give us all things? Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of the Father, who also makes intercession for us. Emmanuel, when no one is praying for you, when you are all by yourself, when things couldn't get any worse, you think, and then suddenly you just get one more piece of news. I want you to remember who is with you. The one that made you, the one that brought you here, the one that fashioned you, the one that purchased you, the one that washed you in his blood, the one that justified you before his father just as if you never sinned, the one that put a robe of righteousness on your back, the one that gave you the seal of the engagement, the Holy Spirit himself, the power that raised Jesus from the dead, the one that is seated at the right hand of the father because he lives by the power of an everlasting life. He said, no one takes my life from me and no one gives it to me. I lay it down and I pick it up because he is the everlasting father. He's the God of eternity. He lives to make intercession for you. So when nobody's praying, Jesus is praying and heaven is praying. And remember who's with you, God himself, who is not about to let you go, drop you, erase you, be sick of you, be finished with you, be disgusted with you, be done with you, Emmanuel, who couldn't live without you. This Christmas could be the beginning of the greatest romance and love you have ever experienced. Humanity will reject, betray, not get us. There'll be great loves on the earth, yes. I'm married to a great love. Oh, but it pales in comparison to the one who loves me, the king of the universe who will not live without me. And he laid his life down, and he picked it back up. Emmanuel, this Christmas, you're not alone, and this Christmas is not about money. 
It's not about relationships. It's not about any of those things. It's about you, and it's about Jesus. And he says, see me in the small because I'm there. He says, look forward to the future, child, because I'm coming sooner than you think. He says, understand that change, the brighter you shine, is going to bring conflict and confrontation. But that's okay, because remember who's with you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'm with you forever. Emmanuel. Did you get something out of today? But I want to just take a moment before we leave, and we've got just five minutes left in the service. We've been here an hour and ten minutes. That's it. And we're about to leave and go back into our worlds, our schedules, all that we do. And I need to ask you a question. Because God brought you here today for a very specific reason. Not just to hear the word of God and to be encouraged if you're a believer. But if you are here and you're seeking or you're searching. Or maybe a friend brought you. I need to talk to you. And maybe this is going to make you a bit uncomfortable. But that's okay. It's worth it. Because I need to ask you about your eternity. You know, life is fragile. I just had a baby, a granddaughter born, six pounds, six ounces, little tiny, little girl. And I looked at this little child and I thought, how vulnerable and how small. And then I think about us as humans. I mean, on a freeway, boom, without even knowing it, you could be wiped out. We can't hold our breath for five minutes to keep ourselves alive. Life is fragile. Death is inevitable. And if you were to die today, if it was your last day on this planet, where would you open your eyes? Because death is not a ceasing to exist. Death is separation. You're going to separate from this earth suit that you're wearing, but you have eternity in your heart. And you're going to be somewhere. And God says there's only two places. There is heaven, God's heaven, and there is hell. So if you were to die today, where realistically do you think you would end up? In God's heaven or in hell? And if you're saying, well, gosh, I hope, I hope I'd be in heaven. I think I'm going to heaven. I'm a pretty good person. Yeah, I'm on my way there. I've got to talk to you. Because you can't hope your way into heaven. And I cannot think my way into heaven. And I certainly cannot behave my way into heaven. And if you said, well, you know, I don't really believe in hell, I have to say to you, how convenient. Just because you don't believe in hell doesn't, believe, doesn't mean it's not real. We didn't believe in microwaves or radio waves or sound waves 200 years ago because we couldn't see them. But just because you can't see something doesn't mean it's not real. Right now, there are all kinds of sound waves and radio waves and all kinds of things in this atmosphere that you and I can't see with our physical eyes, but we are transmitting right now via, via Internet, right now. And we're being processed into zeros and ones, and it's floating through some, some sound wave, and it's transmitting all over the world. I can't see it, but it's real because somebody on the other, part of the, on the other side of the world is hearing my voice. So just because you can't see hell doesn't mean hell isn't real because God says hell is real and God didn't make us for hell. He made us for heaven. But there's only one way to God's heaven. He says you can't get there by your behavior because God says you're never going to be good enough. You know why? Because it's not the standard of each other. It's God's standard. So I can't measure my goodness next to yours because I might look pretty good next to you. But God says, no, that's not the measurement. The measurement's me. And that is God perfection, and I can't even ever get close to that. God says, your goodness is like a filthy rag. It's certainly not thinking, because the devil thinks that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he's not going to heaven. So it's not thinking in your head. Well, yeah, I know Jesus. I mean, you ask an American, do you know Jesus? Everybody knows Jesus. You celebrate Christmas, you celebrate Easter, so you must be a Christian. No, it doesn't work that way. It's not what you think in your head. It's what you've done with your heart. So it's not behavior, it's not hoping, and it's not thinking. There's only one way to God's heaven, and God says you must be born again. This is God's plan, not mine. He's sovereign, he's the king, I'm not. And this is his heaven, and this is how he says is the only way to get there. Born again. Now what does that mean? It means very simply that God came for us and that we have to receive this amazing gift of salvation. Did you know that in every world religion, because I've studied them all, man is somehow ascending to God, either through works or behavior or mental ascent. But in Christianity, 
the truth, God comes to man. And Jesus explained being born again to Nicodemus, who was a great celebrity rabbi in Jerusalem. And Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and the question I just asked you, he asked Jesus. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. This old man said, that's crazy. I can't be born again into my mother's womb. And Jesus said, no. What's born of the flesh is flesh. You are in an earth suit. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Nicodemus, God's a spirit. You're a spirit made in his image. But sin has separated you from God. Here's how you get born again, Nicodemus. You'll read it in John, the third chapter. I'm going to a cross. I'm going to be lifted up on that cross. The very thing that Simeon spoke to Mary about, a sign that will be spoken against. He was born to be the Lamb of God, to qualify to go to that cross. He said, no man lays my life down, and no man takes my life. I lay it down and I pick it up. He is the only one that has the power of an indestructible life. Only God could save us. All God and all man. And Jesus said, if you'll look to that cross and you will believe that I am who I said I am. Look, it's either all true or it's not true at all. And if it's true, we better put our crash helmets on and our life jackets on because this God is the most incredible, incredible being. Who in the world can understand a God that would love us so much that he would become us, qualify? to be our savior, live through the human experience, lay his life down for you and I and take every sin we've ever committed and put it on himself and then invite us if you'll look to that cross and if you'll surrender your life to me and let me be savior and let me be your Lord, then I'll take you out of the kingdom of darkness where you've been enslaved and I'll bring you back to the Father and you'll be born again. But beloved, if you've never done that, if you've never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life to him. Or maybe you have, but you've backslid and you don't trust yourself now because you know how squirrely you can be. Because we're all that way. God brought you here today to get right with him. This Christmas season. You know, I can give my kids a gift. I can give my, cran my grandkids a gift. I can shop. I can sacrifice. I can spend all my paycheck. I can, I can do everything I can to give them a beautiful, incredible gift. But if they don't receive it, then I haven't given it. I can only do my part of giving. They have to receive. They have to take it and open it and use it. You see, God has done everything he can to give us salvation. But we have to receive it. We have to say yes. I believe. I may not understand, but I know I need a Savior. I know you are who you said you are. And here I am. And I want you to be my Savior and my Lord. It doesn't matter what part of life you're in. It doesn't matter how bad you've been or how good you've been. God's brought you here today to change your destiny. So all over this auditorium, if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. If you've been a rascal, I'm talking to you. I'm an old rascal. A woman that did too many things and too many wrong choices and afraid that God didn't want me. But, oh, he wants us rascals. He's the only one that can change us. Maybe you've backslid and you've just messed up. And you think, I can't do this again. Yes, you can. You can rededicate your life to him and come home. Or maybe you've been a really good person and you've been religious and brought to church and, and you've observed the traditions, but you've never, never looked at that cross and believed and surrendered your heart and your life to him. I'm talking to you. So this is how we're going to do this. I'm just going to count to three and I'm going to hit my Bible or hit this book just like this. Bang. Now, my husband, when he claps his hand, it's a really loud noise. I'm just wimpy and it goes bang. But we want you to raise your hand. There's going to be a lot of hands going up in just a minute. We want you to do it all at the same time. And then we're going to ask you to grab everything that you have and come and meet us at this aisle and get right with God as we stand. And the reason we do that is because we know that if we confess him before men, that he'll confess us before the Father. He says, and bow your heads, close your eyes, and you just privately sneak into the kingdom of God. No. This is about saying, yes, I need a Savior. I believe he is who he says he is. I'm ready. So all over this auditorium, I'm going to count to three, and I just want you to raise your hand at the same time. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands. One, two. Let me see your hands. Raise them high for me. One, two, three. Oh, I can't see. Raise your hands. Ushers, help me. Four, five, I see that hand, I see that hand. I see that hand, I see that hand. 
Anybody else need to get right with God this morning? Want to get right with God? I see that hand. I see that hand. Oh, man, do I need glasses. Anybody else? Raise them high. Wave them at me. I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, there's hands going up everywhere. I can't see them. So let's don't waste your time me trying to count. Let's just stand up as we sing this song. I just want you to get what you brought to church and get down to this altar. Get down here fast because I have gone too long. We're five minutes over. Get your cute little butts down here. Let's get right with God now. And today is a day of salvation. If you didn't raise your hand, it's not too late. Just come. Just quickly come, quickly come. He loves us. He's not mad at us. He's waiting for you. This is the best Christmas you've ever had. He brought you here to change your life. You can't change it, but he can. So quickly come, quickly come, quickly come. Quickly come. Quickly come. You're still coming, you're still coming. Okay. You can smile at me. You're not going to a funeral, you're actually going to have eternal life. So this is actually an amazing thing. They're still coming, just quickly come because of time. Okay, so let me see your pearly whites. There they are. There they are. He loves us. He was assigned you angels. Oh, my gosh, they're having a party. <laughs> they are celebrating in heaven. They're going, oh, finally. Do you know how hard I've worked just keeping you alive? <laughs> Actually, he's an amazing God, and there's great joy. There's great joy. This is Pastor Dave. We're going to take you into a private room, and we're going to do three things. We're going to pray with you because you're going to ask Jesus into your heart. We're going to give you a book that my husband wrote. It's very simple, very quick reading, just about what's happened. Then we're going to offer you an SPT, a spiritual personal trainer. We just had a brand new baby. She's in the hospital, but she's going home, and their mom and dad are going to take care of little Emma. You're brand new in the Lord. And we would like to offer you someone that can answer your questions, come with you to church, sit with you in church if you need them to, teach you five things that will help you grow quickly in the kingdom of God. You're not joining a church. You're saying yes to Jesus. But God said, take care of my babies. I want them to grow up and be strong. So you can say yes or you can say no. That's not a big deal. But what is a big deal is you're going to say yes to Jesus. So if you'll make whatever this thing is here, turn in this way. And follow Pastor Dave, who's our nicest pastor on staff. 